Uh, this is a presentation that's very similar to the one we gave at the Regional Working Group meeting, which took place on the 24th of last month. Um, so we'll go through some of that. I did remove uh, many of the slides that are shown to you by Mr. Duda, um, so that's where most of the changes come. Uh, so uh, we want to review uh, what we have been doing and accomplished in terms of the evaluation process. Uh, again, go over a, a shortened um, summary of survey results from not only recent department surveys, but those done in the past. Uh, talk about how that discusses in the current potential um, management strategies. So in terms of the evaluation process, the department has been very busy. We've held over 14 meetings specifically to discuss uh, this evaluation process since January 2012. Uh, we've conducted two surveys since that time, formed three regional working groups who have uh, met a number of times, uh, and those meeting minutes are provided to you. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Board, as you are aware, has uh, an enhanced ability uh, to help regulate Vermont's deer resource. Uh, the department has offered its data and uh, partaken in a review of our biological data. Uh, we've evaluated our current management strategies and spent quite a bit of effort evaluating uh, the types of alternatives that exist and uh, how those may influence Vermont's deer herd and deer hunters. So the public beans we held to specifically discuss this process were different in nature than traditional deer hearings uh, in the sense that uh, we presented them information but spent a significant amount of time in small group discussions. And what we heard from hunters is they broadly agree on uh, management goals and objectives in terms of keeping Vermont's deer healthy, um, sustainable harvest, uh, and so those types of things. And what we did notice though is uh, even though you may have broad consensus on the goals of what you're trying to accomplish, uh, there's certainly some divisiveness on uh, what constitutes the best uh, management approach. And often that's uh, often contingent upon one's personal preferences. So the regional working groups who met for the last time last month uh, were slated with assisting the department in interpreting data and public input uh, and using that to uh, look at more regional deer data for the areas that they are familiar with and, and talking about what that means um, in terms of current strategies and what they would like to see out of their Vermont deer hunting experience. Uh, as I mentioned, they met for uh, the last time last month and we intend on uh, continuing their conversations with the Fish and Wildlife Board as we progress uh, in the evaluation process. So in the last 16 years, the department's done a number of <coughs> surveys on deer hunters and their deer hunting experiences. Um, we'll go through some of these in more detail, uh, but just so you're aware, uh, things like quality deer management in Vermont dating back in 1998, um, comprehensive deer management in Vermont in 2003, uh, surveys about youth hunting, moose hunting, um, and so on. Unless it's specifically said, most of these slides and surveys, I, results I show you are from the department's most recently completed um, deer hunter survey. So through time, what we've seen is a change in the interests of our deer hunters. Uh, if you look at the results from the 1998 survey compared to the one the department recently completed, uh, you can see that just going deer hunting, being with family and friends, uh, the experience of hunting is still the main driver behind uh, the reason of why people hunt. Uh, and so that remains unchanged. But what we do see is a stronger interest in uh, antler deer, in particular uh, their ability to harvest not only an antler deer, but possibly an older, uh, larger antler deer. And we did some questions to define what we thought hunters um, mean when they say older and larger. So uh, being in the woods and seeing deer sign is still uh, the most important factors to Vermont deer hunters, but we have seen an increased interest in management of the buck population in terms of what they would like to see out of their buck hunting experience. So as Scott mentioned, 68% of hunters reported being satisfied overall with their deer hunting experience. Um, this is um, a high satisfaction rate compared to past surveys. 75% of hunters uh, indicated support for the current antler point restriction. We'll see that 72% of them also um, broadly support um, any method of managing the buck population. 71% um, of hunters, uh, when asked how important is management of the buck population, uh, rated it a 10 out of 10, uh, and 41% or 41% rated 10 out of 10, while 71% uh, rated it a 7 or above. So uh, hunters are very interested in how the department goes about managing the buck population, what they want to see out of their 
uh, deer hunting experience, um, and they've indicated that this is something uh, personally they find very important. Uh, so this is a graphical demonstration of what I just said. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, uh, how important is management, buck management, that's important. Uh, do some efforts to manage buck population. 40% of hunters, 40% uh, of hunters that rated this a seven or higher, uh, rated it 10 out of 10. So if we're gonna look, uh, we asked hunters uh, who indicated that it was seven or above, um, and we'll see these results uh, in a little bit. We asked them what uh, that means in terms of older and larger, uh, and we'll look at that. But uh, regardless of the method, uh, do you support or oppose management to increase older and larger bucks? And again, uh, we can see that 72% uh, of hunters appear supportive of those efforts. So um, set aside current regulations, the concept of management of the buck population is something that's of high interest. Uh, to Vermont deer hunters, and they appear to be supportive of those types of management strategies. So as I mentioned, uh, for people that rated management of the buck population seven or above, uh, we asked them, well, how old, what age do you think an older buck should be? So these dark lines here are the people that rated it a seven and above. Uh, so you can see that about 45% of people that thought this was very important thought that was a three-year-old, about a quarter, four, 15% um, five or older. Uh, so, if you take the people that didn't answer to seven or above, uh, and you assume that they are happy just shooting a buck, uh, and we assume that that's a yearling, something with antlers, uh, we rework these percentages. Uh, so, let's assume that everybody that rated the seven or below would be happy with one year old. Uh, what does that do to these numbers since they're really only about 70 or 40 percent of our overall deer hunters? And so, you can see the, the percentages. But what it's important is uh, there's still a uh, high interest, even if you add in the people who just want to harvest any buck, there's still high interest in uh, opportunities, or the desire to have opportunities to pursue older uh, antler deer. So uh, Vermont hunters are very interested in managing the buck population, and in the state of Vermont, what does that mean in terms of our current uh, past and potential alternatives? So. First thing that's important to understand is we've seen a change in the distribution of the harvest through time, uh, meaning that uh, as time has progressed, this is in 1961, uh, this is last year, uh, through time we've seen the archery and the muzzleloader, um, things like the youth hunting, contribute more uh, to the overall deer harvest. And through time we've seen uh, the contribution of the rifle harvest to overall harvest declining. And what's important to realize is that most of this space here is antlerless harvest. So as people have been expanding uh, their hunting opportunities and through time, uh, this increased interest in the diversity of hunting opportunities, if you will, has resulted in uh, more hunters uh, pursuing antlerless deer. So from a management standpoint, uh, this is good, um, but something to be aware of because these trends will likely continue in the future. It's also important that we remember or uh, are, remain knowledgeable about uh, when our buck uh, harvest is occurring, especially we're going to talk about ways uh, of trying to influence the age structure. So uh, the rifle season accounts for over 70% of the antler harvest annually, accounted for uh, over three-fourths last year, um, and the archery youth and, and muzzleloader season generally accounts for about the same number as deer that are harvested on the opening weekend of the rifle season. So one-third of all antler bucks that are harvested uh, in Vermont each year are harvested in the first two days um, of the rifle season. So uh, more deer are harvested that opening weekend than in the other uh, three seasons combined. So when we talk about management of the bug population, it's very important uh, that we remain aware of this because this is where uh, we need to be effective if we're going to have some uh, impact on the age structure. <clears throat> and because there's an intense amount of hunting pressure in some regions of Vermont, uh, if you want to increase the number of older, uh, larger bucks on the landscape, you likely need to uh, utilize something like an antler point restriction uh, because that uh, theoretically all hunters are hunting under that and so that regulation is likely needed to help facilitate movement to the older age classes. And uh, again as this last survey indicated 75% of hunters support um, the current antler point restriction um, which is good I guess. Oops. <clears throat> So uh, before antler point restrictions, uh, the population and the harvest were largely comprised of one and a half year olds a year. So 
These dark lines here are the 2004 uh, age structure. Uh, these gray lines here are the 2005. So in 2005, the first year the APR is implemented, uh, you, there's no changes in the age structure. It's still likely identical to the 2004 age structure, but due to the APR, you see some changes in terms of the contribution of these deer to the overall harvest. So these are percentages. Um, so uh, prior to the handling point restriction, we were maximizing opportunity for buck hunting. Um, and uh, that's a traditional deer management strategy. Under the current two-point antler point restriction law, buck harvest is largely comprised of one and two-year-old deer, uh, and specifically an increase in the number of two-and-a-half-year-old deer on the landscape. They now comprise uh, about 45 out of 55 percent of the harvest in any given year, compared to approximately 20 um, percent. So uh, the population in the population, there are more two-year-olds, uh, and in the harvest there are uh, many proportionally more two and a half year old deer. So the buck harvest has been temporarily restricted or delayed uh, to some degree to on um, one age class. Especially in regions where there is intense harvest pressure, we have no evidence to suggest that the current antler point restriction has led to an evident increase in the number of antler deer that are three and a half years of age or older. Um, so uh, that's an important consideration, um, something discussed in depth by the regional working group. So uh, when you talk about antler point restrictions, it's very important uh, that you keep a couple of things in mind, and that's the impact that such a regulation has on the total buck population in terms of how many are on the landscape and their distribution within different age classes, how that influences the total buck harvest, how many <coughs> bucks are shot, um, not only overall, but in each age class, uh, and then the percentages of those. Uh, numbers, the percent of the population, the percent of harvest. And what you'll see is uh, as uh, these numbers, the total buck population and the total buck harvest, um, as you increase antler point restrictions or manipulate uh, regulations, these can start to look different. And as those start to look different, uh, the disparity in percentages also increases. So uh, changes in the total buck population compared to what the total harvest looks like are, are magnified in terms of the impact that has percentage-wise uh, on the same types of things. So, um, with the current antler point restriction uh, and some potential alternatives, the department uh, has been exploring the impact that those may have. So, this is the total buck population under various um, potential antler point restrictions, and this is uh, the total buck harvest. So, uh, what's important here is this is the overall population. This is the summed age classes. Uh, as you protect more deer. Uh, you can start to grow the deer population. So as you protect a larger proportion, if you think about uh, this uh, bump of deer moving through uh, the population, as you protect more of them, you can increase the number of deer uh, on the landscape. And so uh, these are generous uh, survival estimates. Survival is estimated to be very high for uh, our one to two year old deer. No reason to think it would necessarily decline in productive deer habitat. So uh, you can start to increase the number of deer um, on the landscape as you protect more because you're delaying more deer's harvest for a longer period of time. Adam, clarification, do you mean bucks versus deer? Um, oh yeah, so this is, these are all uh, strictly no, buck you, population. You can, you can support more bucks in the population. Right, yeah, so right now we have no reason to believe we get into a scenario where that would be problematic. So uh, there are some influences then on the harvest. So you're restricting some deer from harvest. Uh, there may be more or less on the landscape. So that influences how many are harvested. And what's important to see here is, again, these are slightly generous um, growth rates. Is you do start to see some decline in your overall harvest as you protect more deer, because more deer are uh, subjected to environmental stress for longer periods of time. So the likelihood uh, of succumbing to non-harvest mortality increases as you protect them. So uh, at some point, you start to have a trade-off uh, where you're going to, if you try to move deer too far, you're going to uh, start to have a decline in your overall harvest. Um, but this can result in terms of total number, um, some differences in terms of, of what the harvest looks like. So if we look at the percent of the population, important to remember that there's a different number of deer out there depending on what the regulations are. So we convert these two percentages to standardized uh, those comparisons. Um, you can see the blue is no antler point restriction, the red is uh, the current antler point restriction, this would be a three point, uh, and this would be a two point APR. 
at the beginning of this, uh, we mentioned that as the total number and the total harvest, those numbers start to change. That's exemplified in percentages. Uh, for example, if uh, there was a 4-point APR, it's plausible uh, that deer four and a half years of age could comprise almost 37, 35, 37 percent of the overall buck population. They would comprise almost 90 percent of the buck harvest. Um, so uh, even though they'd only be a much smaller percentage of the actual population, uh, they would comprise a much higher percentage uh, of the actual harvest. Um, so that's a key consideration uh, to keep in mind. It's also important to remember uh, how these things differ regionally. Uh, those models are for statewide outputs. Uh, so this is data from WNU A and B in 2013, the rifle season. Uh, so we can see an increase, if we compare this to pre-APR data, an increase in the number of two-year-old deer, uh, but no evident increase in the number of deer uh, three and a half years of age or older. If we look at WNU E, we can see an age structure uh, that's comprised of significantly uh, older um, deer. So if the impetus for an antler point restriction is to facilitate movement from the year and a half year old age class to the two year old age class, uh, and there's abundant numbers of older, larger deer already present, uh, that may be a place where um, this type of regulation is needed to achieve our age structure objectives. So if we look at the data we collected just on opening weekend, we can still see uh, that uh, three and a half year olds and four year olds comprise it significantly larger percentage of harvest in WME than uh, they do on the opening weekend of uh, rifle season in A and B. Um, also say that your probability of evading harvest is likely better in these types of places than it is in WMU A or B or farmland country where uh, deer can be effectively moved by hunting pressure. So uh, if we're interested in talking about reaching certain objectives in the age population and let's say we wanted uh, 25 to 30 percent of the harvest to be antler deer three and a half years of age or older. Uh, that doesn't mean that necessarily they would comprise 25 to 30 percent of the buck population. Uh, but if this was our har harvest objective, uh, broadly speaking, these green areas here are places where we would need to implement management strategies to uh, help us get to those places. And these uh, pink or light uh, colored zones, those are places uh, where the harvest uh, is already uh, in excess of 25 to 30 percent uh, to your three and a half years of age or older. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, as you're attempting to manage the buck population, especially uh, one that's being heavily harvested, uh, you can run into some concerns over uh, how you're doing that. And there's some trade-offs um, in the effects that that has. So the increased survival of spike antler bucks, uh, specifically to older age classes, uh, appears to have uh, influence the number of antler points in our three and a half year old uh, deer, our deer that are three and a half years of age are older. So if you're protected under the antler point restriction, your probability of living to be two or three is higher than someone who's subjugated to harvest your first or second um, or third year. So uh, we've seen a shift uh, in our antler points uh, in our three and a half year old deer. And this is a graph of our antler points on our year and a half year old deer from prior to the antler point restriction and since then. And two things are very important uh, in this graph. And one is that they look largely the same. Uh, but there's a key difference right here. So uh, this is the percentage of yearlings that are spike antler. And this has been consistently high. This is pooled data from 2008 to 2013. If we look at individual years within this pooled data, we see the same pattern. And that pattern is that there's been about uh, a five to 10% increase in our spike yearling percentage that we measure during the youth weekend. And this can happen for one or two reasons and it's been very consistent. So uh, there, uh, and so uh, and a caveat to this is between 2004 and 2008, we didn't collect data during the youth season, strictly during the rifle. And so we were not able to obtain this graph. So we come back in 2008 after number of years of not sampling the overall buck population and we've seen this increase and it's been consistent every year since. Uh, and so either there has been a shift in that time when we weren't measuring, a shift in, in the overall antler characteristics of our yearling age class where more of them are now spike antlered, or uh, some of these uh, legal antler deer are being removed prior to us sampling during the youth weekend 
and that would drive this percentage up because there are less legal antler deer um, out there, specifically the archery harvest, which comprises about 10% uh, of the overall buck harvest and very close to uh, this percentage increase. So removal of these deer during the archery season would drive uh, this number up when we measure it during the youth season. What that's suggesting uh, is that uh, you are impacting survival based on antler characteristics and that's having an impact on the antler points of the deer we see uh, during the youth weekend. If that can happen under archery equipment uh, with more efficient weapons, it's likely to think that this pattern would continue. Adam, just, it's a good point in time, maybe just before you talk about this slide, to just uh, reflect on the challenges we have here with the 2004 rifle season data, because what um, Adam is uh, Adam is adamant about is um, that prior to 2004, we really were aging deer in all age classes with tooth wear and replacement. And when we began to pull teeth along with that, we realized that we were uh, misaging some of those older age classes in particular. And so we are almost stuck in a way with having one year as our baseline, the 2004 rifle season for pre APR data based on uh, antler characteristics and age composition. And there's, you know, one of the concerns of Wildlife Management Institute was we should go back and look at years previous to that to tr develop and increase our sample size. Um, but we have that concern about that data uh, may not be as high quality as our uh, cement and annual aging process. Do you have any idea on a percentage of? of Animals that might be misaged in previous years. I mean, do you think it's five percent or? Line depended by age class, right? Right. So generally speaking, they're over ninety-five percent confident. And even those errors are plus or minus one. Um, we have reason to believe that biologists tend to overestimate the age of deer, especially large yearlings, which uh, impacts you know, things like the spike yearling percentage. So. Right, so a big problem is that we have one year pre-APR data, so we would consider that baseline data. And when you start to look at these things uh, for various years, you start to see a little variability, which is due to things uh, like mass and winter severity, and you see that variability occur uh, regionally. And so where uh, WMI and I, and I guess uh, we agree and disagree to some degree is with the statewide regulation, when you see that year-to-year -year variation, uh, you can't assign that um, to anything. And so even if you see a significant shift in this distribution, uh, because you can't pin down uh, you know, those various factors, it's difficult to say what's exactly driving those patterns. And, and so uh, and part of that's largely driven by one year of, of um, creative care data. <coughs> so if this is occurring, um, and we look at our older age class, can I just ask you one question on that last? So on a scale of 1 to 10, how reliable would you say that data is on that last slide? What do you mean? How reliable is it as far as the age data? Right. Is, well, the age data is good. Right, yeah, so we're highly confident in the teeth that we send off and get ages back. But the 2004 that you're comparing it to is not very reliable. No. No, that is, those, those teeth were sent in. So 2004 is the first year the department sent in teeth. And so when we talk about looking back farther, we weren't sending in teeth in 2003 or 2002. And so biologist errors and aging are significant enough where uh, we don't feel those data sets from tooth wear and replacement are comparable to, to the data that we use where we get from a lower central incisor. So uh, we only use um, data for deer that we have the teeth confirmed ages for. The trade-off, I think, is that we're giving you less years of data because we're only giving you more most confident. But we'd like to have a 10-year <coughs> So uh, if survival is impacted by antler characteristics, this is likely to be seen more in the older age classes because they've been on the landscape and experiencing these pressures for a longer period of time. And so, again, these black lines are data from 2004, and these are the point distributions from 2 to 10 plus um, for deer that are three and a half years of age or older statewide. 
Uh, and what we see is, um, generally speaking, at least in 2004, we didn't see any three and a half year old deer with less than five points. Since that time, uh, we've seen a shift uh, towards a lower number, cumulative number of points on our deer, uh, and the occurrence of deer uh, that have less than five points are now more prevalent in the population. So this is an indicator that uh, you know, something is impacting survival of the deer to our older age classes, and we've seen a shift in terms of, of the types of racks that uh, they are carrying. One question, Alan. Yes. Is the definition of a point creating some of the numbers to be off? Because These are all biologists examine deer, and they're trained to measure them if they're close. So if it's three quarters, what are they going to call it? It's not eights? a point. Okay. Even in the pre-2005, we didn't define a point right. here until Correct. 2005. Correct. So that was because oh, no, it's, it's always been one inch. It has. Yeah. For 30 30 years. 30 years. Okay. At least 33 yeah. years. I just want to clarify that. Okay. That's what the biologists have done. Okay. Because yeah. okay. yeah. <laughs> in regulation, we didn't define it until no. 2005. Right. Okay. Um, so this should uh, be uh, something of interest in terms of the impact that the current point restriction is having. We then asked hunters uh, if the current antler point restriction shifts harvest focus onto larger bucks and these smaller antler deer a breeding advantage. Would you support or oppose uh, changing the current antler point restriction? 55% uh, of hunters said they would support uh, such actions if the department uh, felt that was occurring. Uh, so uh, part of the problem uh, with managing the buck population and uh, seeing a shift in the distribution of your points is how do you mitigate those concerns that you may have? Uh, and the answer to that is to attempt to introduce uh, as much randomness into uh, survival as possible. So how do you protect deer, uh, but then still introduce some randomness so you're not uh, strongly preferencing one type of animal over another? Uh, and that, uh, we believe, may be accomplished through the uh, implementation of hunter's choice buck permits or tags. Uh, so this wouldn't be an additional tag or permit, and I'll say if there's a two buck limit, wouldn't let you shoot three, um, but this would be some type of enhancement to your license that would give a certain number of hunters the ability uh, to harvest any buck. So uh, earlier we talked about harvest objectives. Uh, in uh, one of those green zones, if our harvest objective is 25 to 30 percent of the harvest and we know uh, we need to protect more deer, more antler deer for a longer period of time to achieve that objective. Uh, and let's say we implement a three-point antler point restriction, we believe that will allow us to get 35% of the harvest to be three and a half years of age. Uh, we can issue um, by lottery a set number of tags um, that would allow people the ability to harvest some of those deer that do not meet the antler point restriction. Uh, so um, they would be valid in any season open to the taking of antler deer, uh, and it would not be an additional tag, it would not be an additional opportunity uh, to pursue antler deer, what it would be is an enhancement that would allow you uh, to harvest a deer that did not meet um, some WMU specific antler point restriction. And this really mitigates concern over preferential survival. If you are protecting more of the yearlings, uh, you are having less uh, directional selection. Um, and then you're introducing randomness underneath that. So theoretically, uh, anyone who possesses these tags will harvest deer as they become available. Uh, so you're not saving spike horns or particular, uh, you're going to protect all yearlings and then give a certain number of those a random chance of, of being harvested. That mitigates our concerns over uh, which deer are getting older. This is the most precise method, a permit or tag or controlled harvest of these animals. It's the most precise method available uh, compared to all their alternatives. Uh, opening up certain seasons to the taking of any antler deer is not precise enough. Uh, to likely to help us reach our objectives uh, and opening it up to certain age uh, demographics also would probably limit our ability to reach our objectives. So we need a precise tool just like we um, do for the deer management of the antlerless population uh, to uh, reach our objectives if um, we can agree on what they are. And allows for buck harvest um, for the harvest, uh, any buck harvest for hunters interested in doing so. So it provides a more diverse set of deer hunting opportunities uh, and so that may be beneficial in terms of addressing uh, people's various interests in deer management. <clears throat> I'm going to say something else, but it slipped my mind. Huh. 
So we did ask this on the last survey um, in terms of if uh, the harvest of some deer under the antler point restriction is desired, how should we go about that? So uh, the issuance of WMU specific permits um, was not the most supported, um, but it was also not uh, the least supportive of our management alternatives. And again, um, from a broader view, uh, this <coughs> appears to be the best way of mitigating some potential concerns that may exist, providing a more diverse set of, of hunting opportunities, and it certainly is the most precise way uh, we have of managing uh, the harvest of manly deer. So uh, bag limits are also something that can be used to help manage the buck population. If you remember uh, the model outputs um, that I had up earlier, so as you start to change these other regulations, you can result in an increase in the number of bucks or decrease the number of bucks on the landscape. That's going to influence hunters' probability of encountering a deer, uh, let alone a second antler deer. So uh, consideration of bag limits in terms of how those other changes are going to occur on the landscape is important. And bag limits can be used to influence hunter selectivity uh, through either increasing them uh, in terms of making hunters more willing to harvest antlerless deer or uh, increasing hunter selectivity um, by making them more choosy in terms of what they harvest. It's a potential buck management tool and it may uh, decrease deer hunting opportunities. So uh, not many hunters are currently um, harvesting more than one antler buck or more than one deer. Um, so this may necessarily limit opportunity. At the same time, if you want to take steps uh, to increase the overall number of bucks on the landscape, that's going to change hunters' probability of encountering their first deer or their second deer. So um, that will be important. And what you'll see on the right, uh, so this is a map of green dots of deer that's harvested this past year. And on the right, you'll see uh, this is the number of antler deer, total antler deer, including spike bucks to hunters. This ranges from a low of 2.3 in WMUN to a high of 6.1 in F1. Statewide, it's just about four. Uh, and even in E, there's about five hunters for every buck, right? There's less hunters, but there's also less deer. Um, so that ratio comes up. So uh, things like a one buck limit, uh, even if one or two of these hunters may pass on that deer, uh, there's likely, uh, one of the six is likely to uh, not feel that way. So it's also important to consider, um, you know, that reducing bag limits of low and specifically uh, a one buck bag limit would likely not have a very noticeable.